Hello and welcome to a Taylor's Tales podcast. This is Chris's Corner. I'm your host, Chris Taylor, and welcome back to a brand new episode. This week, I'm back in the UK. I have arrived back after some long travels away. I've been off on my adventures, and now I'm back where I started, back in Wiltshire, back in Dorset, the borders of Somerset as well. Uh, I am home, and it's lovely to get some peace and quiet after the noisiness, the adventure, the chaos that was Mexico and the USA. Uh, and my bank account is slowly being drained slowly <laughs> by, by all the adventures I have had. So it's time to come back and make some moolah, make some money to be able to refuel for the next uh, financial adventure, but also to uh, look at the future plans, take what I've learned from my adventures in the USA uh, and in Mexico and try and figure out what the next step is. It's, there's been nothing better than the travels refreshing my mind and allowing me to have a greater perspective on the world and me as a person as well because the pandemic took away two years of my life where although I used the, them as the most efficient and consistent and useful period of time that I've probably ever had, it's also a period of time where I haven't seen as many people, I haven't uh, been able to go on adventures and see the world, and it has uh, put me into one area of the world for the, for the longest time that I've been in since I was a youngster. So it's been an absolute privilege, a pleasure to have been able to go out of the, outside of the UK for the first time and uh, something like three years and visit Mexico in the USA. So I will start off this podcast on a really positive note because it has made me really appreciate my just lifestyle, the way I live, the who, who I am and the stuff I get to do. There's nothing better than that. And so in this podcast, I want to talk about the things that I've learned from my travels all the way from Cancun to New York City uh, and to talk about some of the things that you as maybe a traveler want to know when you're traveling to Mexico and to uh, the USA. I have spoken about many of these tips in the previous podcast. So for specific destinations, I will have given greater detail in places like Cancun and greater detail in places like uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, and in California and so on and so forth where I've talked about those specific destinations but I can give a great overview of the travels in general. So th this will be broken down into a few things. I do want to start off with something really positive and something that um, will be very, you know, maybe people knew this already, maybe you're a very positive person like myself, but the world the media and social media as well as that makes everything feel a little bit darker than it really is. The truth is, the world is a fantastic place. People, 90% of people, are nice, they're kind, they're fantastic, they're awesome. People in general, and I thought this beforehand, but through the pandemic you could have thought there were a few numpties. 10% of the world, it seems, that the negative few are reflected as a greater percentage than they really are. And so what I would like to get across is that when you go traveling, uh, you will meet some of the best people you'll ever meet because they have had the same feelings as you to be able to escape their homeland, to be able to go abroad and see a new destination and try and live a new lifestyle. And I think that's really important. And what you do realize is that the people who don't leave their own country uh, a little bit more ignorant to the rest of the world and those are the 10%, they're fewer than the 90% of those who are the good people, the, the people who, who want to be positive. And it is, I, I'm a huge believer in that now and it's revalidated my love uh, for human beings in, in general and made me realize like, ah, I can use this to my advantage when it comes down to my job, my lifestyle, my work, by being surrounded, by being in a more people orientated environment uh, in my role, as, in my job, which I will be pursuing now. Um, and for my company as well, I have realized through my time of traveling is that you know, the digital nomad lifestyle is for a very specific type of person. I thought I was super disciplined. For most people who have listened to this podcast, um, and if you are have been a, a listener for a while, you'll know that I have a, a rigorous routine that I go through. Uh, and I thought that made me a disciplined person. But it seems to me that you have to truly love those things to be able to continue them. 
And when I look at the digital mo- nomad lifestyle where you're surrounded by the beach, the, the, the beauty of the world and travelers and all these things, I want to go out and enjoy myself. I want to be on a vacation. I want to, you know, it's, I'm in vacation mode. And all of these people, I see them working and coding and, you know, doing graphic design and doing uh, video- videography and loads of uh, YouTubing as well. And I'm like, how do you separate the two? That's, for me, the most uh, important thing when it comes down to, uh, you know, for work, for me, I separate my home life from my work life. And that's quite a black and white statement, and that's fine for me, it works for me. But for the digital nomad, it seems to blur a little bit. Uh, And I find that, because one of the hostels I stayed in, in Porto Escadido, I'm pronouncing that terribly, by the way. I got corrected on it by a couple of Spanish people, but I'm British, so you can allow me this uh, terrible pronunciation, was that the hostel said it was just surrounded. You know, if you came in at nine o'clock in the morning at the bar, you would just see all of these digital nomads all working from their laptops. And I meet, here's me just having a coffee, doing some reading, doing some writing, and then going to chill at the pool or going to the beach uh, for a walk or a run on the beach or going to work out or going to go see dolphins and whales and photography and stuff like that, leisure stuff, Uh, or listening to music and and, and walking about or going to find good food. And they're all getting work done. I'm just like, how do you separate the that lifestyle i imagine there's many people out there who are saying chris it's so easy what are you talking about like you should be able to be able to do the both but for me i have to be in a a a setting that is purposefully for work it has to be you know a work environment and that's what i found so hard about remote working is that you don't have that uh sort of separation you have your home and your work in the same place now my dad's been doing it since i was like five years old so i've always been so impressed with his ability to do that and for me i don't know if i could do the same i don't think i i have it in me per personally maybe i could later on in life but for now it's it's very much a black and white scenario for me to to keep the work away and then the uh the vacation of vacation so the two months off when i first talked uh, on the podcast i was i thought i was going to utilize it as a time to get uh, into a new type of role but the truth is i was just going to be doing the same work i was going to be doing when i was working for for companies except i'd be doing it abroad in a a nice environment and it just didn't work for me so those, those are two big things there is that people are awesome and the digital nomad lifestyle is for a very specific type of person uh and if you are that person i can tell you now mexico and you know soon to be southeast asia where there's low costs of living uh, then you're going to have a great time. You're going to make some a lot of money and you're going to not have to worry about things. And it seems to me that, you know, th- it seems to be for somebody who can separate the work and the vacation. Here's another piece of advice. Speaking of the locations within Mexico, if I am going to give one piece of advice, if you are somebody who is trying to get away from the partying and stuff like that, just don't go to the East Coast, except for Barcala. So, for the east coast of Mexico, I'm talking about Tulum, Cancun, uh, Port, um, Playa Karma. Just don't don't go there, okay? If you're not into that sort of lifestyle, just just avoid them. Go more towards Barcala, and then from Barcala, go into the center of Mexico, to Oaxaca, to San Cristobal, to uh, Puerto Escondido, to Puerto, like all of that region the Oaxaca region in itself is there's so much to see uh, and I only scraped the surface of it so my advice to you if you are someone who is not a partier just don't do the east coast there's no point doing it Uh, and I think that that region as a whole is very much a tourist trap so piece of advice there just to start off the podcast Mexico is an incredible route for travelers though so even though I give the East Coast a hard time, it is a great place to start and to get your bearings and maybe to get over a jet, jet lag. I've spoken about this before, but it, I reiterate it because it is important to say. You're going to have jet lag somewhere. I'm dealing with jet lag right now and I'm back in the UK after coming from New York. Uh, the five hour difference for me has been very difficult. It's been hard to get to bed uh, at a reasonable hour. I've been setting my alarm for seven o'clock and when I do wake up at seven o'clock, it feels like I'm, you know, slowly dying inside but you have to take the time to get over these things and you can't expect yourself to 
be indestructible and get get over them immediately. Uh, when I was in Cancun, it took me three days to really get over that. And I think you need to have that time to be able to get over the time difference from where you're coming from, especially if you are coming all the way from Europe and you're not coming from the USA. So keep that in mind when you are traveling that jet lag will play a part in um, you know your travels. And if you're very lucky and you don't get any, then you are one of the few and the many will be uh, indeed having to deal with uh, the tiredness and the drowsiness and the emotional changes and your hormones will be uh, affected by it as well. So you may find yourself just all over the place. So again, these, these, these little things, these little details can really play a part in uh, how, how much fun you have on the holiday. So, yes. So, the, what we've talked about so far, we've talked about the how good people are. The digital nomad lifestyle is for a very specific type of person. The East Coast of Mexico is very much a party zone. And that you may find Mexico in general is a party zone. And that you may have to sp specifically pick certain places to go if you're trying to avoid that and you're not into that sort of you know vacation or you know holiday if you're trying to revitalize yourself for me personally as well the chaos of traveling can interrupt some of your good habits for me i didn't meditate once while i was uh, actually no i that's a lie, i did meditate once but it was once at the end of the holiday in the middle of my holiday when i was in mexico city it feels that when you're traveling, you have to get something done every single day. And that can be something of a problem because you feel like you have to, you know, if you're in Mexico City, you've got to see all the sites, you've got to see all this, you've got to do all that. And it can feel like you're doing that. And sometimes you may want to allocate a little bit more time just so you can slow down and relax. That's one mistake I made when I was in Mexico. I was going from one destination to another day in, day out. And there's a reason why I'm very tired right now. I'm still going to go for a run later. I'm still going to get my shit in. But, you know, there's a point where you have to understand that your body is going to crave sleep. I've been sleeping 12 hours the past two days because I can tell that I am physically knackered from the, all the traveling I've done and all of the stuff I've done because I've just been getting in there. I think I took a total of three maybe four days out of the total two months where I just was sat at the hostels just doing nothing. Four days out of two months probably isn't healthy and it you should probably spend more time extending that to three months and then chilling a little bit more. I probably should have done that. I probably should have done January to March and really slowed down the traveling uh, throughout them. And what I wish I'd done with the USA, and here's a you know, a big piece of advice for people who are thinking of traveling. Transport in the US is very much quite expensive if you're going from one side of the country to the other because you're most likely going to, going to fly. And so for me, I was finding I was paying like £100 per flight between places. Not for some of the closer destinations, but some between, for instance, Las Vegas and Austin, uh, you know, Texas to Washington DC, or from Denver to Austin, so on and so forth. Those those areas, there's quite a distance between them. And so you're paying for me as well, because I'm adding luggage as well. It's an extra $35, uh, which was around 25 quid for me to check in a piece of luggage. So you're paying your hundred pounds and then you're paying an extra 25 pounds for it. And it adds up. If you do what I've done, where I did um, a flight from Mexico City to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to uh, a bus down to San Diego, San Diego flight to uh, San Francisco, San Francisco flight to Las Vegas, Las Vegas to Denver, Denver to Austin, Austin to Dallas, Dallas to Washington, D.C., uh, D.C. to New York and then New York home. All of that money adds up real fast and it equals over a thousand pounds. And that is a lot of money for traveling, for transport. And I think that what I saw with Mexico, where I just did ADO buses, it may have taken longer to get from one place to another, but I kind of wish I'd done that with the US a little bit. Because the Greyhound bus, yes, it's a, you know, it's not fun, the types of people you're surrounded by. It's not like on a flight where you are, uh, you're surrounded by people you know, normal people in Greyhound buses, you do find that there are some, uh, shall we say, uncouth types of people you're surrounded by, and that can 
maybe affect whether you want to be on that Greyhound bus. I found that with both San Diego and for my fl and my bus from DC to New York, both had a few uncouth uh, human beings on the buses. But like I said, it's only the ten percent there, and it you know the flight difference between Washington DC to New York and the bus was I paid thirty three dollars for the bus, and the flight was going to be one hundred and thirty pound one hundred and thirty pounds. Yeah. Which is nuts. Huge difference. Huge difference. So you have to take that into account. And the ADO bus that I took across Mexico was incredible. Uh, the transport there is so cheap. Uh, I think the most I paid was £33. Uh, and that was a 12-hour bus ride. So, again, it depends on what you want. I went for a little bit of luxury with the flights across the US. I have the money to do that. That's... You know, sometimes you look back and wonder whether you should spend it. For me, it was probably a good idea because I was trying to get in as much as possible. But I may have seen a little bit more of the USA, like countryside, if I'd gone via bus. And so it's it's ups and downs with traveling. You can think to yourself, ah, it would have been nice to see that. And for me, I can say that I've seen Mexico so countryside because I because the amount of buses I took between places and physically saw them when I was traveling uh, but the US less so because of the amount of uh, planes I took so ups and downs what I what would I recommend in that case I think for the US you have to consider taking more planes purely because of the distance between places but also if you've got a longer period of time like if you've got two months in the US I think that's that's a lot easier to get about because you can dedicate a full day to traveling between places and you can probably get more destinations in rather than where I'm going from hopping from one place to another. And so it can, you know, this is a lesson, lessons you learn from, from traveling. And I think I'm also intrigued to see a few other countries that I've not been to, see, see how they uh, handle a traveler's route, I'll call it. Because the Mexico traveler's route from Mexico City to Cancun is pretty, you know, every traveler I spoke to had a very similar de like destination or a very similar path they were going through. And so I think that, I, you know, when I got to the USA and there wasn't a similar path and there weren't many international travelers when I found uh, going through the USA, it was a very different process. It was all purely on me. And so there was no recommendations. There was only just going through what I thought was best. Uh, and I kind of miss the advice. When you get advice from other travelers when you're going through a country, it really helps you because you can add destinations that you've been advised on. And, and if it really interests you, then you can go there. And then that piece of advice either works or it doesn't. And you can take on board and, and feed it to other people if it works out. Or if it doesn't, then you say you write it off. And so this is why I did that whole episode on Austin and Texas as a whole, because it was important to get across that, you know, if you're a traveler, like you want stuff to do. You want to be seeing stuff. You want your, you're spending your money and you want that money to be reflected in the destination and, and, the, and the hard work you've put in to get that money. And so if you are misspending it on places that don't have a lot to give, then that's a little bit of a letdown, isn't it, at the end of the day. So keeping that in mind transportation and having a route to go from you know when you're traveling it can, can really make or break how much fun you have when you're on that travels so for me my next few destinations i'm really interested in trying to do interrailing in uh, europe because i've never i've actually only realized like how little of europe i've properly seen and so i'm going to try and do some of that and obviously I'm going to try and do Japan uh, and Austra Australasia again at some point because as much as I've visited Australia I've never done the backpacking through it like you know you know I've I've back I've I've done like a month where I've been there but it's not it wasn't a proper I was doing it so young I was like 19 at the time that it felt kind of rushed and I spent too long in 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 only a few places so I'd really like to get to know uh, the Australian country a little bit more so there's so many places to see so many places to go but i am going to be going for more places that have these travelers routes that are well known and are more towards travelers because i'm going to get into this now the u.s hostel system is and i do not say this lightly total horseshit and here's why <laughs> it's because they overprice they're, they're totally overpriced for what they are 
um, they are not as good as Europe, number two. And if if you go to Europe and you pay 30 like euros a night, you're expecting quality, you know, for a hostel. In the US, they charge $40 a night and it's nowhere near the quality that you're, you know, 30, 30 or $40. And it's it's ridiculous, some of them. Some of the best ones I saw the, it were New York City, Washington, D.C. and San Diego and San Francisco. These four destinations had the best hostels, and I think that they it's because two of them, the Washington DC one and the San Francisco one, both had a homely vibe to them. They had they were run for travelers. You could tell because there was a a, a hub of where to hang out, where to have breakfast. I think the San Diego one had this as well. It was a little bit smaller, but it definitely had this homely vibe to it, and it had an atmosphere. But that th th that's the key word, that atmosphere. The US was lacking any atmosphere in all the other hostels I stayed at. There was zero people traveling. Maybe it's the time of year I chose to travel through the USA. But also, like, I was going through Mexico and the atmosphere was in every single hostel I stayed at. There was always something going on. There was always somebody to chat to. There was, I was meeting so many people. My list of people who I met through Mexico is huge my mix my list of people who i met through the usa is probably i shit you not probably 10 people or less uh and it, it is to me that's ridiculous like you clearly i mean the usa has not got the memo when it comes down to how to um have a hostel system i mean they've got homeless people and people over the age of 40 staying in there they're meant to be called youth hostels for a reason like they're for the youth they're meant to be lower priced because they're for young people and the amount of like, I saw, I, I genuinely, there was like a couple who were in their 70s staying in a hostel. It was, yeah, I it blew me away. Not that people should be like discriminated against, but like, it's called a youth hostel for a reason. And it is a little strange that you find that happening. Uh, people over the age of 40 staying in hostels in, in the USA seem to be really common. That was not common in Mexico at all, or any, any other hostel I've stayed at. I've probably met... I. In the total time that I've travelled and all the hostels I've stayed at, I've probably seen people people over the age of the forty, like maybe once or twice. It is meant to be for young people. It is meant to be, you know, in that in that scenario. And then on top of that, the as well as I say the pricing and the lack of an atmosphere, it was also, you know, the there was no breakfast included for many of the places. There was um, some of the locations. You know, there was a lack of, you know, tours going on or places to go see. San Francisco one was fantastic. They advertised on the walls of places you could go nearby in San Francisco. My Yosemite tour was probably one of the best tours I've ever done. It was absolutely incredible. They picked you up in the morning. They took you all the way to Yosemite, gave you loads of information. You got regular stops to get food and stuff like that. You got to go out on your own for three hours, not having to be, you know, shown around the place. And then you, when you got back, you were exhausted and you went to bed and you were sorted. And you got back in the evening evening like early morning late night fantastic and the people at the hostel all booked it for me sorted just like that and as soon as i asked them they knew exactly what i was talking about and they booked it and it's the exact same in mexico they've got so many things going on that you can book it in all the other hostels in the u.s very minimal stuff like that and i found it kind of discouraging because it made meant that there was less to do and it meant that i was going out of my way to find stuff every single day to be able to do some days you just want a day where you don't have to think about these sort of things and let someone else take the you know you pay somebody extra money so that you don't have to worry about those things because you are on vacation again i'm being a little bit spoiled in these in this scenario but i am letting you know because if you do the same this is the scenario you have to go through and this is the things you have to think ahead of um if you are really in, if you don't drive like me and you want to go out and see uh, you know the real countries then you do have to rely on these things and so one another thing I've learned from this is that I am going to be getting my driver's license I will be getting it because it will add this extra level of freedom you no longer have to rely on the system you can go out on your own but again a lot of travelers don't drive when they go abroad anyway even if they do have licenses so it is that lack of accommodation it is it was quite surprising it is what it is and you move on from there so yeah what else is that yes so i've got some of the notes down here for a second i'm just having a look uh yeah 
routine, both good and bad. Ah, yeah. Require a card, don't stay in the hostel. Yep, 90% of people are good. Mexico is an incredible traveler's route. Obtain further freedom, require a car. Yep, consistency is hard to maintain. So let's go through these two. We all need a break from normality, and routine is both good and bad. So those two link very closely. Routine routine is both good and bad for, and something that I found in the pandemic for a lot of people is that they, they either got into really good habits, and they were really effective and healthy people and they were becoming better people or a lot of people were really deteriorating and so routine is both good and bad because you can either get into a cycle where you don't see the outside world and you get into a bubble and you you forget that the rest of the world is going on and that's really important so the break of normality is where that comes in you break the routine to be able to reset and to be able to understand that your your tunnel vision your tunnel vision of the world is not actually what's going on. You are not the only thing that's existing. The rest of the world is happening right now in the background and you need to understand that and need to be able to go out there and realize that that's going on to be able to recenter yourself and be like, right. There is loads going on in the background. The world is existing. The world is going on. The you know We are on a, a sphere floating through time and space. That is a fact and you are going through it by just thinking in your perspective of, of the tunnel, for me, luckily, because of my traveling, I understood through the pandemic that I would be stuck in a bubble and that the world around me would need to, I need to expand that bubble to really get a grips. And by talking to other people, you get better perspective. And that's why traveling resets that bubble, which has grown smaller as you are in the pandemic because you are sat in a box, basically. Uh, and so resetting can also be really good for your health you could could be someone who's like me extremely fitness and all these things and your body may just need a little bit of relaxation i reduced the amount of running i did and by doing so that has allowed my body to you know really really uh, reset and i think the decrease of running has helped me uh, i've put on a little bit of muscle mass more uh, i feel like i've put on a little bit of weight overall around i think i came back a kg and a half heavier which is really good to be fair because the amount of food i was eating in the us uh, and i was trying to keep a track of everything that i was doing but generally speaking you've got to uh you've got to be aware that when you are traveling you are going to find it more difficult to uh, you know, consistently work out and all these things and to keep in mind that you may find that there are days where you, you can't uh, get that gym workout in or get that run in. So keep that in mind. Like That's why I said like routines are good and bad. Sometimes your routine is so uh, structured and so rigid that when it comes down to finding some flexibility, it can feel really painful initially. But from there, you're going to build yourself up to be able to adjust to the world around you rather than having that tunnel vision. So that's, that's really important. And I think that for me now, because I've taken this two month period off, I'm going to get back into work. But I'm also going to make sure that I book some serious vacations, like two or three weeks off where I go traveling again, because I want to have that reset every three months so that I can truly have this mindset, clear mindset clear vision of what I want to do, clear vision of what's important to me and what my future goals are going to be. And I think that's really good. I've noticed this in everyone where they come back home, they get that peace and quiet from the chaos, and then they want to get back out there into the venture. And I think that's exactly right. Getting out there to reset every now and then uh, is, is you know, effective to the human body. So locations, food, you know, fitness, transport, personal opinions, all of these things I've talked about overall. Uh, I think that for me personally, Mexico was definitely the more chaotic of the two. The US has a little bit more structure, but the US is more nuts in terms of people. The Mexican people are amazing. They're so polite um, and they're always there to help. You just need to watch out, as I've said many a time, for being out after dark. That's about it. Uh, when it comes down to the US, I've talked about some of the nuts people were already in, in previous podcasts, so watch out for that. And those, those are the only two downsides to both traveling through both of those, 
you know, countries. And so for me personally, it's a great win uh, coming out of both of these, you know, going from Cancun all the way to New York City because it's shown that there is a direct path that you can do. Uh, and there are some really interesting places you can go to. Some of the photos I've taken are, are going to stick with me for a lifetime. These memories are going to stick with me for a lifetime. And all the people I've met, uh, and I hope to stay in contact with them and, and visit them in their own countries because it's really interesting uh, meeting people who have similar mindsets to you but also have that uh, want and need to do better in life and to not just be on holiday all the time. That's another thing. So the vacation mindset, so many, this is something that I found, social media to me has become even more fake since I've come back because I realize how people uh, show this quote unquote, you know, lifestyle, because it's not a lifestyle. It's 90, you know, these photos and these videos are like such a small amount of what actually happens. But the reality is, is that it's really just, um, everything online actually doesn't exist. So the amount of false pretenses and, and false statements made and, and all this, oh, look at me, I'm here. It's not, you know, I like to be a real person. I give you a real opinion of what I've done. Yes, I have fun. Yes, I'm smiling a lot of the time. But the reality is, is that the photos you take are lasting around 10 seconds. One of my favorite moments for me was me taking a photo on the Empire State Building. It's probably one of the only selfies that I'll ever post. Like, I don't like selfies. They're not um, something that Ed Sheeran said recently. Is somebody takes a selfie and posts it because they want um, and because they're in a bad place and they want attention. And I think that's a really he's hit the nail on the head. Like social media is like a uh, a tool, but for me as well is really good to show family and friends I'm healthy, alive, all of these things, but also a reality check uh, for you on, on what you want because social media is meant to be what you, how you want to represent yourself. For me, I've always thought of it um, as something where I post the, the consistency of my life. Like I post about running and podcasting so often, it must be so boring to people. And I want it to be because that's normal life. Like if you're posting like, something quote unquote amazing every week every week or every day in day out that's not normal life like you're gonna find yourself burning out after a while uh, the amount of youtubers i see where they're like i'm taking a break from youtube because they're putting on a false personality it's like no wonder you're exhausted you're not really being yourself like me right now on this podcast the reason why i love podcasting is the person in, in the microphone or the conversation that happens with people is real like, they don't have to put in any effort in. They're just being themselves. Like, that's... If you're having to put effort in, into being someone you're not, you will burn out, you will be exhausted, and there will be no coming back for you because people will eventually catch on that you are not the person you say you are and that from there, it's just, ah, this person is clearly selling me a box of lies. So, when you go on vacation, enjoy yourself, take a few photos, post them, Enjoy that process, but don't, you know, pretend like your lifestyle is that. Because it's not. Mine definitely isn't. I spent eight weeks. I sent, uh, I think I posted like eight times, like once a week. And then I'm. what I've learned from that is that I can actually take photos each week. Uh, and I've been posting once a week for the past something like 10, I think it was like since I started doing the uh, podcast highlights. And so by doing that, I'm going to continue to do those. So it's either going to be like photos or a podcast highlight each week. And so it creates a normality. There's no longer this, ah, it's just when you're on holiday. The only good times are when you're on holiday. No. The good times are all the time. Happy and sad come and go. But if you find the meaning within your life and find what you enjoy, then it's it's going to be, uh, everyone's going to be thinking you're living the high life all the time within a normality not on vacation. So I am emphasizing that I am really, I hope if you learn anything from this podcast, all the tips I've given there, this is the one. You need to make your normal night, normal life just as exciting as the one that you're going to post about when you're on vacation. Period. So whether it's like me, where you're talking at a camera for half an hour, do it or running or all these things. Or if you find something that you really are excited about, let's say you like baking or you like drums, or you like, um, you know, driving, or video games, or whatever, that 
If you're doing that consistently and you truly enjoy it, that should be what you posted about. Not the quote-unquote vacation lifestyle. So, enough ranting, enough judgment, enough of that. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I don't normally say that, but I will say it at the end of this because I'm in a particularly good mood today. Uh, I think it might be the ability to record a podcast without some somebody coming in and out of the behind me in the shot or ruining the audio. <laughs> so, ending on a high. I hope you've learned something from this podcast. If you've made it all the way, congratulations. You have uh, have got some sort of perseverance, uh, and you've been able to get through my vo- vocals uh, for this long. <laughs> So, this has been a Tell Us Tell podcast. This has been Chris's Corner. I'm your host, Chris Taylor. And as always, I hope to see you this time next week.